Uh, so let's see, what were the keys here again? The key point here is how does this break off the end amino acid? Well, the, the N-terminus nitrogen attacks this carbon, and then this nitrogen attacks this carboxy carbon. And, that, uh, and when the N-terminus attacks this carboxy carbon, it ends up cleaving this bond. This is basically a nucleophilic attack on an amide, a nucleophilic attack on the carboxylic acid derivative where this is the L group. So as usual, we're going to unform the carbonyl and then reform the carbonyl. Uh, so this tags the N-terminus, and then we attach to the C-terminus here, uh, and we end up with a ring that's separated from the rest of the molecule. Okay, well, uh, that's all I have to say about the Edmund degradation. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, now, remember I was just talking about how this only works when you're, um, you're up to, say, 50 amino acids, but uh, a tr actual proteins can have hundreds or thousands of amino acids, so I said that you could chop them up into smaller fragments and then do the Edmund degradation, but what can we use to chop them up into the smaller fragments? Well, those are the proteolytic enzymes like chymotrypsin and oh, yeah. trypsin. Those are things that you've seen, so that would be a good next topic for us to video. Right. That's right. So we don't need to spend too much time on that. But we can use those proteolytic enzymes to um, chop things up into smaller pieces. So let's see how that would work. So let's figure out, so what do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have a heptapeptide. A heptapeptide. Let's figure out what it would look like after we treat it with chymotrypsin. What it, it cuts it at P-H-E-T-Y-R and some T-Y-R. By the way, yeah, most instructors, they, they'll give you that, the, the cleaving information in the table. Did your instructor say, do you have to memorize where this cleaves, or are they yeah, going to give no, you that? He said he's going to give us everything, but... Yeah, he'll probably give to us, but... Yeah, so there's a table in the book in section 26.5. Maybe it's good to look it up. Or maybe you already got it memorized. So anyway, you, know, you need to know how to use the tables. So yeah, chymotrypsin cleaves... P-H-E-T-Y-R-Y. What were you saying? P-H-E-T-Y-R-Y. You got it memorized now. Very good. Um, is this what you were saying? T-R-P. No, T-R-P. No, I said T-R-Y, but... Yeah, you might have gotten confused with this. But we need to know, is it going to cleave at the amino end or the carboxy end? Carboxy. Right. So I think we'd be given that information on the test. OK, so let's show what we would get then. So going along here, the first thing that we encounter is phenylalanine. By the way, is this the N-terminus or the C-terminus? We just have to memorize that the convention is that the N-terminus is on the left and the carboxy terminus is on the right. We just need to have that memorized. So we've got glycine, phenylalanine, and are we going to cleave the phenylalanine on the left or the right? Right, on right. Because we just memorized, our, we just looked up that it cleaves on the carboxy end. Arginine, lysine, then tyrosine, and we cleave here. So what are we going to get? We're going to get glycine, valine, phenylalanine. That would be a tripeptide. We will get arginine, lysine, tyrosine. That would be a tripeptide. And we'll get glutamic acid, a single amino acid. Notice that this does not have phenylalanine, tyrosine, or tryptophan in its fragment, but it gets cleaved anyway just because it's at the end, basically. So this is an interesting point. How many cleavages did the chymotrypsin make here? Two. And how many fragments did that produce? Three. So that's a little bit of arithmetic that confuses people. 
However many cleavages you do, you get one more fragment than that. If you do two cleavages, that makes three fragments. If you do three cleavages, that would make four fragments. And the one that doesn't have the bimolar or tryptamine or whatever, you know is going to be the end. That's right. We know. That's a very good point for deducing the structure. Um, so that, that's an important point. So we, the, the problem with chymotrypsin is after it makes these cleavages, we won't know what order these fragments were in originally. We don't know whether this came first or this came first. But you're right, we know that this must have come last, because otherwise we can't explain how it was made otherwise. If this was in the middle, it wouldn't have been cleaved. So um, the fact that this does not have phenylalanine, tyrosine, or tryptophan on its carboxy end means this must have been the carboxy end itself. But we can't tell which order these were in. These could have been in either order. Of course, it's perfectly possible that just by chance, this could have been tryptophan. If by chance this had been tryptophan, then we would have no idea what order these were in. But in most cases, by chance, uh, what did they have this as before? Lutamic acid? That's right. OK. So, um, and then, like I said, now that we've got things cleaved into smaller fragments, um, maybe we could do an Edmund degradation. So if the original peptide was too big, we could use chymotrypsin to cleave it into fragments, and then we could do the Edmund degradation. Um, now, there's some other um, enzymes that cleave on the N terminus. You always have to look that up to see whether it's cleaving on the N terminus or the C terminus. It's the same basic idea. So what have we talked about so far? We've talked about how to synthesize an amino acid, and we've talked about how to figure out what the sequence of amino acids is in a polypeptide. The next logical thing is, how do you synthesize a polypeptide? So we've already talked about how to make a single amino acid, but how do you put more than one amino acid together? Remember, I was just talking about how useful it would be to know, say, how, uh, what the amino acids were in insulin, so we can make it ourselves. But it doesn't do you any good to know what insulin is made out of unless you can actually put the amino acids together in the right order to make it yourself. That's right. So when we're trying to put the amino acids together, the hard part is it's easy to get two amino acids to attach to each other, but the problem is that there's many different ways they could attach. Um, for example, let's say you just have two amino acids, A and B, and you want them to attach to each other. Well, the problem is that if you don't use any blocking strategies, you'll get this, 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 and this. If you just put the two amino acids together, they'll attach in all kinds of different ways. So you could have um, one amino acid attack itself, um, or you could have one amino acid at the C, N terminus and the other at the C, or you could have this one at the N and this at the C. So we need blocking strategies to make sure that we can just pick out one particular combination that we like. That's called direct coupling, right? That? I'm not quite sure what you mean by direct coupling. I'll have to see what they talked about in the, in the lecture notes for that. But yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. Let's say we're trying to make glycine and alanine. So let's say we're trying to make a dipeptide. Glycine and uh, alanine. Well, glycine these to each other. And we want to do it in this order. Now, in a sense, this reaction is pretty simple. Is this a nucleophile? Um, yes. Yeah, because it's an amine, not an amine. So this is a nucleophile. And we know that the carbonyl carbon is an electrophile. Now, there is a competing reaction that we've talked about where the nitrogen could also deprotonate the carboxyl group here. But we talked about if maybe we uh, adjust the conditions, we can favor the nucleophilic attack. So there is a way that we can form the amide bond here and kick off this leaving group in a two-step addition elimination. However, the problem is, the problem is, how are we going to prevent this nitrogen from attacking this carbonyl, say? Well, we need to protect this nitrogen. We need to protect this nitrogen so it doesn't do the attack. 
there's a bunch of different uh, protecting groups. Uh, one protecting group is carbobenzoxy CBZ. Is that something you saw? Okay. So that would look like this. I guess it's got a benz group and an oxy group. I don't know what the name is coming 